All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Emily Santiago. I am the director of the Center for Cognitive Diversity. And we have monthly trauma-informed guest lectures come in to, to talk about their work and to highlight best practices in, in the field. So we're really honored today to have Paulina Whitehat, um, who is Diné and a member of the Navajo Nation. She is doing work at the University of Oregon in, uh, she is a PhD candidate uh, and she will be sharing her work with indigenous students and communities today. So thank you so much, Paulina, for being here. Thank you, Emily, for that nice inter introduction. And again, I wanna say, which is good morning to our, the people in the audience. Thank you for joining us today. And it's good to see you out there, even though it's in a, in a virtual format. So I'm gonna share some information from my research and also from my experience about working with indigenous students and communities using trauma-informed practices. Okay, so first I'm gonna um, start off with an introduction and this is important for indigenous peoples to do because that's just part of what we do and to make, and we do this so that other people know who we are and you know, there might be relationships that we have with with people. So first, Yate, um, I'm a Diné Sana, which is a Navajo woman scholar. I was born and raised on Diné Pitea on Navajo land in Northern Arizona. I'm a fluent speaker of Diné Bizad, the Navajo language. Currently I reside in Oregon and what brings me to Oregon is my studies at the University of Oregon. And just a little bit about um, my education. I'm currently a PhD candidate in the special education department at the University of Oregon. And my graduate work includes um, educational leadership work at Penn State, and then also bilingual and multicultural education at Northern Arizona University. And I also got my undergraduate degree in elementary education with an emphasis in Indian indigenous education at Arizona State University. And most of my professional experience has been in the field of education spanning from early childhood to higher education, and then also in diverse communities um, from urban settings to suburban settings and also to rural settings um, in Arizona and also in South Dakota. And I've taught indigenous students. I've taught like students from all kinds of backgrounds. And before I returned to school, I was a reading interventionist and out of school coordinator. I also completed my school and district administrative internship. I was a classroom teacher and I was also an English language learner teacher. And then I was also a para before I pursued my teaching certificate. I was a homeschool liaison and a tutor for the largest public school district in Arizona, which is Mesa Public Schools for their Title VII at the time program, which is um, focused on supporting uh, indigenous students. In my research interests, um, are varied, but they're pretty much focused on um, developing and implementing interventions to build capacity for trauma-informed practices in school systems and communities, and also taking this knowledge and affecting educational policies and countering the effects of poverty and adversity experienced by students, especially um, historically oppressed students. And right now, um, my dissertation is mostly about teacher burnout and stress reduction. And so my overall goal is improving wellness and mental health for students and school staff in school setting settings. And this is where um, this organization, Cognitive Diversity, you know, helps with that. And I'm so grateful that I got involved with, with this organization because it helps me 
get the word out and bring some information and experience from from that actually into practice. And here's a little bit about the background of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so the history of indigenous peoples of the Americas include ongoing genocide and oppression to present day. So it's not a one time experience. It's ongoing from first contact with with um, people from other parts of the world to present day and it's ongoing and it's probably going to keep going on into the future. Indigenous peoples and communities still exist today and each of us, no matter where we are in North America, we are on the land of Indigenous peoples. And this, some institutions and organizations have started using or doing a land acknowledgement. And basically it's a statement that recognizes and respects Indigenous peoples as traditional stewards of the land that we're on and the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. So it's really important to, for all people to become knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the land that you're on. And this includes um, like knowing who the original inhabitants are, the history, the status of that land, the current issues to understand, appreciate and become an effective ally, co collaborator, and also an environmental steward and advocate. And this is important because land, indigenous peoples have a relationship with the land and that's why it's so important to us. And this is because we are, like I said, the original stewards of North, the North American continent, plus also indigenous peoples on, on other parts of the world. They have similar um, values. There are several ways to find the traditional stewards of the land that you're on. I'll, I'm going to put a link in the chat as well as how to find an app for your device to to um, to do this. And these are resources that are not all inclusive, but rather a starting point to start your own research. For example, the University of Oregon. And the city of Eugene, where I am currently, is, late, is located on Kalapuya Alihi, the traditional home, indigenous homelands of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties, the Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homelands between 1851 and 1855 by the US government and were forcibly removed to Western Oregon. Today, their descendants are citizens of the confederated tribes of Grand Ronde, and also the confederated tribes of the Siletz Indians. And they continue to make important contributions to their communities and beyond. And this is important to state that because our representation is almost invisible and it's designed to be that way. So this is a reminder that people are still here. The indigenous peoples are still here. And then this is also, um, to have people understand how they benefit from the position, the dispossession of land and also to, to disrupt the colonial settler and the white supremacy narratives that erase our erase the representation, the voices of indigenous peoples. And in a bit, I'll put that in the link. Um, those resources that I talked about. And why is this important to know? Because education has been and is a tool of assimilation, genocide, and, opp and oppression for Indigenous peoples. Education was used by the government and settlers to gain access to land and natural resources. Residential schools and boarding schools were tools of genocide. Indigenous children were forced to attend school and harmful tactics such as sign or starve treaties or executive orders and other legal documents were used to transfer lands, resources from Indigenous peoples to the government or to settlers and the children were sent to boarding schools. 
and they were literally used as pawns and treated as host hostages during these so-called negotiations. And schooling can be, as a result, schooling can be problematic for indigenous peoples due to this historical experience and the trust. So indigenous peoples, students, families, you know, when they're um, distrustful of schooling, it's for these reasons. Okay, the heading um, kind of like says like what the the purpose of the boarding schools and the residential schools were like kill the Indian and save the man. These words were spoken by Colonel Richard Pratt in 1892 during a report of how the boarding schools were doing. Um, right on the right hand side is a picture of indigenous students in non-indigenous clothing and short hairstyles which reflect the assimilation process. And this photo was taken at um, Carlisle Indian School in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And then on the left is a Dines student by the name of Tom Torlino. And he was also at Carlisle Indian School. And with this picture um, is a, stu a student of, or it's a photo of a, the student this Tom Torlino, when he entered the school in 1882. He's in the clothes that he's he was accustomed to wearing before he was taken away to school. And then on the right hand side is a photo of the same student three years later. And records show that the student left the school in 1886 with the equivalent of a second grade education of that time. And records show that he was living in still living in 1910 in New Mexico. And the Native American children were forcibly removed from their homes to attend boarding schools where they were stripped of their culture, which is evident in these pictures. In addition to boarding schools, early col colonial constructs of higher education focused on civilizing and Christianizing Native Americans. For instance, institutions such as Harvard, William and Mary and Dartmouth operated from Christian based educational models to convert Native Americans from savages to civilians. And I share this because, you know, you know, those, those were very harmful practices that, that still, that we're still living with in indigenous peoples that have to do with education. So first, so next I'm going to kind of um, shift to some of the principles that that we used um, to try to use like trauma informed practices to to help indigenous students. And these are the principles that the cognitive um, diversity organization uses. And they're also like recommended by SAMHSA to work with or to help improve uh, mental mental health of of people. So first, safety. Um, when you're dealing with indigenous people, like establish a welcoming and respectful environment for students, parents, and the community. Provide and maintain a space where students and community members feel safe to share and participate without judgment. And then I'm sharing a quote from the Honorable Robert Yazzie, who's the ne, he was a judge. One should treat their relatives well, treat people no matter who they are as if they're your relative. And in the, the Navajo way we call this, it's kinship. So if people could just treat other people as if they're relatives, then, you know, there's, that shows respect and people will feel safe and people respond to that, especially students. And then also understand that tra trauma explains behavior. It provides insight into certain behaviors. And I'm sharing this because sometimes um, 
like the non-Indigenous teachers and school staff don't understand like the behaviors that Indigenous children are exhibiting. And some of this has to do with um, like behaviors that are deemed problem behaviors are often due to a desire to self-protect or mechanisms for coping, especially if a, a student is um, experiencing trauma. And then I, I have this image of the, the iceberg. So seeing a, chi a child's behavior is like seeing only the tip of the iceberg. Remember, there's more going on beneath the surface that you may not be aware of. And then here's some more information about um, triggers and behaviors. Um, if you're not used to like working with students who who exhibit certain types of challenging behaviors, it can take time to realize you're dealing with a trigger. And I guess this recognition often involves knowing and being engaged with the student over time. And student responses do not always make sense or match our expectations. So this behavior like oppositional might be because the students, a student is avoiding rejection. And then if a student is being overly compliant, it could be that the student is avoiding their emotions. And then if the student is like um, has an outburst, it might be because of um, there's just built up emotions and other experiences. And if a student presents with a lot of anger, um, they might be denying hurt feelings. And then also if a student is presenting as depressed, and it might be because their anger is turned inward. And sometimes also like the outburst could be like anger that's turned um, outward as well. And if a student is argumentative, it might be because they're testing the relationship with you to see how you react. And then if a student is um, reacting with rapid escalation, it might be because their alarm system is heightened, which is a trauma response. And then this is not all inclusive and it's not just only um, limited to indigenous students, but you know, to other students as well. But this is kind of like, I'm sharing what I've kind of learned over the years from working and teaching indigenous students. And then some adults could be um, kind of present the same way as well. And remember that behavior is a form of communication. Okay, the next, the principle of choice is um, like provide opportunities and identify options for parents, students in the community to make decisions that benefit them. Um, with this, welcome innovation and also be flexible and allow for the curriculum and school practices to reflect and embrace neurodiversity in learning and also in the, cur in the curriculum. And then I'm bringing up choices. Um, so in schools, like schools that actually practice what they say with tra trauma-informed um, practices are gonna have students, give, give students a choice to like for their hair, like indigenous boys, males, both. We are used to having long hair and we have a special relationship with, with our hair, taking care of it, maintaining it. And a lot of indigenous peoples believe that our knowledge is in our hair. So, you know, allow and advocate for, for especially indigenous males to wear their hair long and with braids and also in their traditional hairstyles. And then also um, allow for the curriculum to reflect indigenous like factual history um, shared, you know, hopefully from an indigenous perspective, like here in Oregon, um, the SB 13 was passed in 2019, I think. And um, it's basically the tribal history is our history and it's supposed to be in the school systems. And I haven't really checked to see how that was going on, but you know, there was a huge 
advisory committees that went on to so that indigenous peoples and communities have a say in the inclusion of tribal history in the school curriculum, the K-12 curriculum here in Oregon, in, in Oregon public schools. And tribe like schools are located on tribal lands. They have, if they're on sovereign land, they have the right to teach the curriculum however way they feel, especially the history. And then also allow for beads and feathers, especially during graduation, to be worn, because that's a significant achievement for, for many students that they've earned a feather. So, you know, allow that. And then the next principle is trustworthiness, um, like value and build relationships first, because that's really important with Indigenous peoples. Like um, at the beginning of this talk, I kind of like introduced myself. And if I was talking with other Indigenous peoples, and especially if, if they're Dene, I would go as far as introducing myself in in the Nebizod, my my language, and establish my clans because a Dene person, a Navajo person, has clans, and we establish like before we even say our name, anything else, we establish that first. Like, what are what is my clan? What is my father's clan? What is my mother's father's clan? And then my father's father's clan, and then we used to do this traditionally to establish like how we're related to other people that are in the room in our audience and then those people come up to you and say you know what you're related to me by this way you're my little sister you're my aunt you're you're my grandma and however way you're so we so those are really important so establish that first and then also Part of this principle is honoring tribal sovereignty and tribal protocols. And this includes like being knowledgeable about, um, especially if, if a school is located on, on tribal land, like those lands are gonna be sovereign. Those tribes are sovereign and they have their own laws and they're gonna enforce it however way that their laws are set. And then there's certain protocols to, to use and always remember to be respectful. And especially if you're on sovereign land, that you're you're a guest and remember that you're a guest, that you're merely a guest on the lands of, of indigenous peoples. And really wherever we are in, in the Americas, we are on tribal land and always carry yourself like that with respect. And if you are respectful to people, there's, you can't really go wrong. And then also involve community members and tribal entities in the planning process from start to finish. So if you're starting a program, if you're doing research, what, what, what have you, whatever activities, check with like what the, what the process is from be, even before you begin a project or any kind of activity and also to finish. And, there's also like the idea of data sovereignty if you're doing research or even if you're implementing a program like the tribes and the communities, they would like to know like how how the project is going, like where where you are. And then some tribes will even ask for that data. Like my tribe, the Navajo Nation has their own IRB. And before you conduct um, research or implement a program, you have to get approval from the, the, the tribal council and get approved. And then an Navajo Nation will usually ask for like a memorandum of agreement or a memorandum of understanding. And then usually at the end, they'll say, okay, where's that data? You're gonna share that data with us. And then you're gonna share that data and like, what is what is the status and what are the outcomes? of your research project or of the program that you implemented, we like to know. And usually this is usually done in the community or it might be before um, tribal council. And then also use predictable schedules and agendas. This way people trust what, trust what you're doing and they're gonna know what to expect from you. And 
so that so that those kind of activities go a long ways and then also be transparent when people ask you for for the status for information for resources you know be transparent about it and that goes a long way and then this is for like the schools like in the classroom um like building a safer environment and sometimes indigenous children struggle with um regulating emotions like positive emotions like how to display that and um so to build positive emotions first and foremost safety like make, making sure that students are physically and emotionally safe in a space um the structure of the space should be predictable and like having consistent routines and then self-regulation model it and teach it and like i said a lot of the times um some households don't really teach it or model it so then students get caught up in that dysfunctional um that dysfunctional family those structures so you know like see what's going on talk to the students observe and then like respond appropriately and then sense of belonging and significance of a person like that helps self-esteem and like tell students messages like you know tell them i can do this and i belong here and then a sense of belonging is very important because as indigenous peoples we are on our own lands and we should no one should be going out of their way to make us feel unwelcome because we are on our lands and i've seen people you know become territorial and say harmful things but remember you're on indigenous lands we belong here so extend that belonging to students and their parents and community members and then celebrate successes whether they're in the classroom or out of the classroom or in schools or organizations like get to know have a relationship with your students your staff and whoever you're working with so you know what's going on in their life and when they do have you know celebrations or successes celebrate them and acknowledge it and and people will know that you're invested in what they're doing and you know they'll say oh you know that person notices what i'm doing and you know they they recognize what i'm doing and then like con sometimes there's consequences when students you know like make certain decisions or whatever but make sure that the consequences are appropriate that they're safe they're predictable and that they're consistent like mostly for everyone and this is the same thing with staff if you're working with adults making sure that those kind of things are predictable they're consistent because sometimes you know people talk and then they'll say well this is what how this the outcome of this situation was different whatever so just be consistent and then next i'm going to talk a little bit about conceptual um frameworks um and this is for like i guess to use lenses um either in research or when you're practicing um like on the on the left is Broff and Brenner's ecolog ecological systems model and it has the individual the microsystems the mesosystem the exosystem and the macro system but um sometimes um as indigenous scholars as in indigenous practitioners and people who work with us sometimes we have to indigenize those frameworks and like on the on the right is a model of this of Broff and Brenner's um model but it's like indigenized and this was this is the work of Jill Fisher or Jill Fish she's a she's an indigenous scholar and basically what she's done is she's placed the um she kind of just kind of rearranged some of those some of those systems and she put the chrono system um in the center and the macro system the individual 
the microsystem, mesosystem, and the exosystem. And this is important because um, basically, like for indigenous peoples, like our past, um, they, they're like interrelated to what's going on today. And then our culture is very important too. So it doesn't make sense to have it like removed from, from the individual. And so this model here by, by the indigenous scholar kind of just rearranges that and that makes sense to me. And I wish I had seen this when I was doing some of my research and it was only this summer that I became aware of this model. And I, cause I was trying to use Broff and Benner's um, model and it just didn't make any sense to me. So just kind of like sometimes frameworks, you know, most of them are not set in stone, reimagine them, indigenize them for your, for your population. And, um, and it works because it makes sense. And then um, practices, um, some of the practices, and I don't know what happened to my to my slide on empowerment, but these two slides were um, to, were to follow empowerment, and I goofed up somewhere and lost the empowerment slide, which is another principle of the trauma informed. So again, be flexible. <laughs> so some of the practices that indig that have been used with indigenous students and populations are like making sure that your staff has the circle of courage training. And, um, and then also there's another practice, which is really similar to this circle of courage training. Um, it's called the gathering of Native Americans. And it's recommended by SAMHSA. And it's usually used to um, just help support um, people who are like, who are trying to rehabilitate themselves um, to addiction and any kind of addiction. And they use um, principles which are used by many indigenous peoples. And like this circle here, like the belonging, the mastery, the generosity, the independence, those are um, some of my family members are Lakota and I recognize those, those values. Um, as they're part of the, the local the value systems. But I know that other, other indigenous groups also have those same value, um, values. And also indigenous peoples have similar values, but we're not all the same. Like we, right now there's like 572 different federally recognized tribes. And that's not including the tribes that are not, that don't have state or federal recognition and all of us, all of these groups, and there were more, but um, we all have different, we're all different. We're not the same. So sometimes people try to lump us together and try to use like a, a, a framework or a program and think that if it works here, that we can basically trans, you know, use it and then people will respond the same way. And with those kind of, um, programs or frameworks, it's best to talk to the community to first to see how it can be adapted. And um, the same with these programs, like even though we have similar values, it doesn't mean that our people are going to respond to this, to it the same way. Like my my tribe is, is pretty huge. Um, we just, the my tribe, the census office, which basically is the enrollment office, um, said that there's probably over half a million um, Navajo tribal members and there's like about 110 different communities on on my reservation and like even even though we're one tribe we're split up into five different agencies and each agency is not the same as the other agency even though it's on the same reservation and even one community and one agency is not gonna to respond to a program the same way as another community have. So it's best to talk to, like I said, the community, see who the community leaders are, who the influencers are, and talk to those people and to get some kind of activity going, like if you're implementing your program or if you're doing research. And then um, collaboration is another principle. Um, 
that's part of the trauma-informed practices, allow feedback and input from students in the community, incorporate student strengths and abilities um, in learning activities, incorporate culture, cultural and indigenous knowledge into lessons and activities, work together to listen, to share resources and strategies. And like I said, this just kind of ties into what I just said before, like talk to, to people in the community, to the leaders, to see how this can be done and what it will look like. Then, so I'm gonna share um, the NEF philosophy of learning, which falls under collaboration. Um, we have like a framework for this, and this is kind of, I borrowed this from the Chin Lee Public Schools, which is a school district, a public school district on my reservation. So we have this cycle, um, oops, um, at the top here in white is Nsaha Kiss, which is thinking, and that's um, the easterly direction. And this basically allows people to work together to work through, like towards a vision, like a work towards a common goal. And then the next stage would be Nahata, which is planning. And this is where the group develops um, a goal to fulfill our purpose. And then in the yellow is Inna, which is living, and that's the um, the westerly direction. And this is embr embracing life's values through continuous learning. And this is the idea that even though you're an adult, you're not finished learning, you're still learning. And we share that knowledge with, with our relatives and so that we achieve a common goal, so that we plan for future generations, so that we include our elders and vulnerable people in our community, and also just working people, so it's inclusive to everybody. And then the next stage is which is assuring, and that's like the northerly direction, um, like basically reflecting on accomplished goals and objectives and you can see the different steps along the way like functions as a team foster a positive environment strength trust and loyalty um, among the stakeholders take pride and use evidence to demonstrate accountability for the for the work embrace high expectations and value continuous learning and maintain a safe environment so that's kind of like an example of um, a learning process, and this I know I share this one because this is from my tribe, and I know that each tribe has a similar um, philosophy of learning. And the next is um, compassionate disruption. Th that principle um, allows for reflection and vulnerability. They allow us to address the bias within ourselves and encourage and support each other to create systems that disrupt injustice prejudice and an oppression in all its forms. And um, so this also like to put it into practice, this would look like focusing on strengths rather than using deficit lenses or frameworks. And I'm studying special education and I'm not gonna go into this, but I think for me, it's problematic to, for, I guess the the special education special education system to operate and use deficit lenses or frameworks to label children with a disability, and then to me it's harmful because that child that child or that individual now has that 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 disability, which determines you know that they have to live with that. It's part of their identity. So as indigenous peoples we didn't do this like traditionally, like we don't, we don't point out like some, if someone has a disability, instead what we did traditionally was we focused on their strength. Like, yeah, this person may not have disability, but they have these strengths and we're gonna focus on it. And when we see them in our community, in our family, we don't point out that, we don't point out their disability. We just didn't do that because that we didn't see that person as 
you know, with deficit lenses, that person is our relative, that person is part of our community, and they have strengths that, and they have abilities that we don't have. And each individual is seen as, you know, an individual that contributes to their, to their community. And then this also looks like refraining from engagement in damage-centered research. And the research by Eve Tuck, um, she, she writes about this and I have um, her work in the reference section, but basically she says, you know, she's an indigenous scholar and she's a professor in, in Canada, but she just basically says, don't see us as damaged. Don't see us as broken or flattened communities. We're still here. We have strengths. We have strengths that are not even acknowledged. And we're still here. We're resilient. We have been coping with um, the colonial structures since first contact. So recognize those, like what we have to, to offer, such as caring for the environment and the respect that we show for not just people, but our our non-human relatives, like the two-legged, the winged, the minerals, the stars, whatever, everything in the universe, we, we have respect for that. So I wish that more people re would recognize that that um that we have those contributions. And another thing I didn't put on here was like um like cultural appropriation. There has been a lot that has happened. A lot of that that's happened with either ideas, knowledge like the US Constitution, the Bill of Rights, those were all borrowed from indigenous peoples without being, without indigenous peoples getting proper credit. And if those were practiced the way indigenous peoples um, lived traditionally, we probably would not have a lot of the, the, um, the issues that we see in our society. And then, so this includes like a paradigm shift, like change how we think about students and people, especially people of, of color. Instead of, instead of saying, what's wrong with you? We should be asking like, what happened to you? What helps you? And people know what helps them. And if we know what helps them, we're gonna know how to respond. And then asking these questions, they provide context compassion and strength so that people can cope so that they can be resilient and when they're experiencing adversity. So I'm going to close here with um, some indigenous knowledge. And this, this, these words, let us put our minds together and see what life we can make for our children were spoken by Tatanka Iotake known to many people as Sitting Bull. He was an Unkpapa Lakota, and he was born around 1831, and his life was taken in 1890, and he was a fierce proponent for his people, and he was, he always tried to bring people together so, so that they can plan plan for seven, the seven generations ahead of us. And that's the way indigenous peoples used to operate that we that we plan for the next for the next generations, seven generations out. And the reason why we do that is because of anything that we have, or the children are the most valuable resource that we have. So that's why um, them being sent to boarding schools and the way they are they're treated in the school systems, that's really harmful because, you know, the idea of um, Eurocentric schooling was kind of forced, imposed on us, but yet our children aren't treated well. They don't do well. And if you look at any research like achievement data, um, indigenous peoples, don't do well in school, in formal Western style schools. Um, there's a lot of dropout rates. 
school completion usually doesn't happen. I think there's less than like 1% of students who go on to higher education to get bachelor's degrees and, and even less get graduate degrees and even less get um, doctoral degrees or other professional degrees. So, and then also our students are referred to special education and placed in, spe in special education disproportionately to other ethnic groups. And they're expelled more often. They're suspended from school more often. So the quality of education that they receive is not adequate. And it's really problematic because indigenous peoples were forced to give up our lands, our resources in exchange for education, which is a treaty right. It's a, tr a federal trust responsibility that was negotiated in treaties, especially tribes that have formal treaties with the United States government that were ratified by Congress and also by the Senate. But we're saying that we're not, our, our children aren't getting the education that was promised and healthcare as well. And, and all this, and we gave up so much. We gave up our lands, we gave up our culture, our languages, you know, in those boarding schools, the languages were erased. The cultures were erased. Um, the way families raised their children, those were all erased. And sometimes when the children did come home, some of them did pick up the, um, those cultural practices and that knowledge that, that they didn't learn, but many didn't. And also they have issues with identity. And, and of course, all this affects the mental health. So I encourage you to join us and to see what, you know, so that we can plan together and come up with better practices that are trauma informed, that are sensitive to the experiences of other people. And, you know, be mindful that not everybody has the same experience that that people of privilege have. And even I, um, a doctoral student, I'm privileged to be here. And there are so many people that are unable to be here and I represent them. So I take my role in where I am and what I'm doing um, with honor. I'm grateful for that, but I'm also a voice for those people that are not in the room, that are not in the rooms of these institutions that I've attended because those institutions were not designed for people like me to be there. They're not designed for people to succeed. And I see what I'm doing as a resistance to people that design these systems. And I'm here to disrupt that colonial settler and white supremacy narratives. And I ask you to join us and in doing that. So, and that begins with being knowledgeable about, about indigenous peoples, about other people's experiences. And of course the land, because all of this land here in, in the Americas, are the traditional homelands of, of indigenous peoples. And once you get to know the history of that, you know, that's like a starting point. And that's what I have for, for now. And here's the references. And I will find the, um, the links to those, to those apps and that I talked about earlier. I just couldn't find them right at the moment. So, yeah. Thank you so much, Paulina. We're really honored and fortunate to have you join us today. And I will send an email out with the links that you want to share. And I don't know if it's okay to share your, your slide presentation, but I can do that as well. So yeah, let's just take a moment to, to show some gratitude and, and thanks for Paulina. And then we'll open it up for questions. So um, do people have any, any questions uh, with all the wisdom she shared today? I see people expressing gratitude in the chat. So thank you for that. I, I have a question, Paulina. Uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for, for sharing with us today. 
I was wondering as uh, as as we are in relationship with and communication with indigenous people, if there's vocabulary that you could share with us that we should be sure to include or vocabulary that we really need to eliminate from our speech as we as we communicate with with folks. Sure, that, that is a very good question, Nicholas. Thank you for asking that question. That's important. Um, some of the, I guess, the most respect, respectful and appropriate way to acknowledge and refer to indigenous peoples is by their tribal name, like I'm Dene. And the, um, I guess the, the, the English version of that in the English language, uh, we're called Navajo, but we, mm -hmm. you know, get to know like how indigenous peoples refer to themselves. And like I said, there's over 572 different tribes and, and that doesn't include tribes that are not um, recognized by the state or by their federal, federal government. So like the Kalapuya that I talked about earlier, they're the original inhabitants of the Willamette Valley all the way from, um, I know that the Willamette Valley, Val, Valley is like a really huge area, but they, that's, that's who the original folks were that lived here. And so, like I said, that, that link that I shared, the, that's not all inclusive, but that's a starting point to get to know um, like how to refer. And then sometimes there's even tutorials like how to pronounce those. And then, um, and of course, um, any kind of terms that are racist or derogatory, like the R word, for example, that was used by an NFL team. You know, I'm glad that was laid to rest. Um, like, I don't know, there's just so many that I can't even think of right off the top of my head. And I know that the, the Inuits of Alaska and the northern part of the of North America do not like to be called Eskimo. Um, they like to be called Inuits or their their group name. And then referring as an indigenous as an indigenous woman, I find it very derogatory to be called a squaw. So don't ever use that. Um, I'm originally from Arizona and we had a, a city or a, a mountain right in the middle of Phoenix that was called Squaw Peak. And it was finally laid to rest. That term was finally way, or laid to rest this year. And pe businesses, people were so upset about it. And I, you know, there's, and then also when indigenous peoples are talk, there, there's a movement called Land Back, which is to repatriate um, land back to indigenous peoples and indigenous peoples um, refer to the land like certain points and they use the indigenous names like like in Flagstaff, Arizona, one of our secret mountains um, is right there and we call it Toko Slid, but in most non-Navajos they call it the San Francisco Peaks. So like try to get to know that and know how to use it, know how to pronounce it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Paulina. Any other questions in the last few minutes we have together? Yeah, I just really appreciate how you pulled together so much information in such a short amount of time. I think it's 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 such a great guide and I, I'm glad that you were here to share it. We have it recorded. If people need to go back and reflect or wanna share it with others, we greatly appreciate that. Um, as many of you in the call are part of our trauma-informed specialist program, I just wanna let people know that aren't part of it, that we do offer a 10-month trauma-informed specialist certification program and uh, Paulina is here as a guest lecturer within that program. So our next program starts October 9th. Um, and we'd love to have you join us or, or share it with others. So as we work to make changes together um, in this time. So thank you, Paulina. And thank you all for being here on a Saturday. That shows that you're really committed to, to making positive change in our schools. So I wish you all a wonderful weekend and we'll stay on for a few more. Minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you.